to the Kevin Sutherland Foundation's roundtable titled Reimagining Local Government. And I want to, to thank everyone who is here in the room and everyone who is joining us online this evening. Those of you um, in the room um, will see that in front of you you've got a, an HSF brand and bottle of water. You're getting a sneak peek of our new uh, rebranded imagery. It's, um, it's a logo which looks either like a sun, and we know we desperately need uh, some light right now in this country, um, but it also looks like an open book. And we like that ambiguity, and so this round table is part and parcel of one of the key objectives of HSF, which is that we look to advance deliberative reasoned exchange. So from that, uh, we're able to produce um, considered, careful policy and decision making. And we're really uh, grateful to all of you for, for joining us um, tonight. Um, and just to say thank you so much to, to my team, the HSF team. Um, we're here in reduced numbers this evening. Um, some, like uh, our colleague, Ezekiel Kakana, is um, tending to uh, family um, grief and is unfortunately unable to be with us. Uh, but um, I know that the team worked incredibly hard to pull this together. Um, so you've been an absolute star. So thank you so much uh, for, for that. Uh, but we're really, really honored to have with us uh, today uh, a really distinguished panel um, and individuals that I uh, would say we're, uh, we, we consider friends. Um, to first up on my left is uh, Lukona Mugi, who is a political activist uh, and a noted commentator uh, with a great deal of experience looking to enhance community involvement and looking to address uh, municipal failure and failure in service delivery. His work at the Ravonia Circle uh, has led to the type of sustained engagement, uh, community outreach, and dialogue, which has to be at the core of deliberative, reasoned, informed policy and decision making. Um, and he obviously will pre present a, an expert, uh, informed insight into local government. Next to the corner, we have um, Kalila Nchuli. She is a commissioner at the South African Human Rights Commission, and we're really happy, um, delighted to have us um, have her with us. She has also um, played a large role in looking at uh, the role of local government uh, accountability, service delivery, and its impact on human rights, um, pulling together a recent uh, conference hosted by the South African Human Rights Commission on the subject. And then next to her, uh, we have Lance Joel, who is the Chief Operations Officer of the <coughs> South African Local Government Association and the Tra an Autonomous Association of all 257 South African Local government Governments. And we're really delighted to have you here, Lance, um, and to have uh, your expertise and insights. Uh, and last but not least is Dr. Tracy Ledger. Uh, she's from Parry, the Public Affairs Research um, Institute. And she's done extensive research and studies on uh, local government, government, focusing on developing new theoretical framework, <coughs> frameworks uh, with which various outcomes, institutional outcomes can be interpreted. And she has written extensively on the topic. Uh, and the way that we're going to proceed this evening is that I am going to sort of set out um, some of the key things that we at HSF have identified as critical, and we're then going to sort of proceed along um, our panel and asking them to provide some insights, some responses to some <coughs> of these themes. Um, and we'd ask that they keep their inputs uh, at around 15 minutes, and we will then throw it open to uh, the, um, the general forum for question and answer. I know, I mean, those joining us today, online, and in the room, you're all engaged um, individuals 
concerned at what's happening in South Africa uh, on a day-to-day -day level uh, in terms of realizing the promises of our constitution. There is perhaps nothing as central and impactful as local government service delivery and, you know, in truth what we're seeing, failures in, in service delivery um, and, and um, you know, for much, for much of the country. Uh, and we have, we know that there are, are, are myriad challenges facing a local government today and we're hopeful that this discussion will elicit and highlight those. Uh, we also recognize that, um, that there are imperatives around decoupling politics from administration in order to reduce constant interference by politicians in the administration of municipalities. We know too that um, the instability and uncertainty caused by coalition governments has real knock-on effect and real impacts on uh, municipal and local government service delivery. Uh, we know too that there is that there is a role um, that uh, that has to be played by organisations like the South African Human Rights Commission, by Chapter Nine institutions, by civil society at large. And we're hopeful that this discussion can address some of those. Um, and we're also obviously very conscious that uh, communities themselves have a large role to play in terms of addressing and providing some resolution for these service delivery issues. And so we're hopeful that the discussion uh, will be able to tease out what some of those um, actions might be. And finally, we want to look at um, what potential mechanisms might be put in place to deal with, to provide oversight of, to tackle corruption, mismanagement, lack of service delivery, um, and also, obviously, uh, to incentivize and to, to better deliver a professionalization <coughs> of the civil service that is operating at a local government level. So that, I know, is a huge number of issues. Uh, we're not, we're certainly not expecting that you address all of those in your, in, um, in your inputs, but we're hoping that you might be able to touch on some of them. Um, and we'd certainly be very uh, interested in hearing the response from, from those in the room and online um, <coughs> to those things. So I will start with you, um, with one if I may. Um, decided not to do the right thing uh, when this sphere of government is concerned. <coughs> there are a number of issues and I'm going to start off with just the idea of how much has been done trying to understand the problems of local government um, the, the problems are not new. I think they just become worse with time. Um, I, I always think back uh, to Dr. Sidney Mufumadi's era, when the department was still called the Department of uh, Provincial and Local Government, and the amount of work that was done um, on back to basics, and uh, trying to understand uh, how do you make sure that uh, you know local government uh, functions better. <coughs> and there was one key thing that was highlighted there. I will leave the budget issues to Lance because they've been complaining about the budget of local government for some time, but that's their job, they're an advocacy group to government. And the uh, government has highlighted the need to listen to them, but there's no responsiveness uh, to that particular issue. So we, uh, uh, post-1994, we went for wall-to-wall, -wall, uh, so-called wall-to-wall municipalities. My recent argument is that you actually don't have wall-to-wall -wall municipalities in South Africa by virtue of special constraints, particularly in the rural municipalities where the municipality effectively has jurisdiction 
the Sun municipality is over 10% of the land <coughs> that makes up that particular municipality. Which that means that um, that municipality, uh, if you go where I come from in Flagstaff, uh, in the Nusa Hill local municipality, uh, the municipality has a jurisdiction in that town from where the municipal office is. You drive out of town, and before you get to the first turn off towards Holy Cross Hospital, which is probably less than five kilometers, uh, the municipality ceases to have jurisdiction and that becomes then under traditional leaders and traditional authority. So that means then um, in that uh, situation, uh, there are certain things that the municipality can't do in my village. Of course, they have the responsibility to maintain our gravel roads, but in a middle income household like ours in the village, they don't have the capacity to generate rates. So you then have this negotiated uh, power between uh, the municipality and traditional uh, leadership. And in actual fact, the municipality can't even decide uh, the spatial configurations uh, of those lands. And some of the big challenges the municipality have been complaining about is to say, well, the traditional leaders, uh, you know, apportion pieces of land right into the entry point of the town and people can build and put crowds and they say, you don't need crowds to be so close to the city center and all of that. But the municipality doesn't have uh, the negotiating power with those traditional authorities. If you go to Mizana local municipality, for development purposes, uh, the city has been trying to negotiate with traditional leaders to at least sell uh, the land that is closest to the town in order to be able to expand the town, but the traditional authorities have actually effectively said they will not do that. This for me is a, is a, is a serious uh, issue that needs to be interrogated when we talk about wall-to-wall -wall municipalities. It's very different from the metros, and this is why I've, I've, I've started to become a bit more uh, interrogative about our institutional arrangements of local government rather than simply uh, lament the collapse of municipalities. I mean, when I did research at the Mizano local municipality, which is now the Minimati Mandela local municipality, uh, in about 2017, 2018, they were sitting with a budget of about 360 million rands and about 65 to 70% of that budget was being spent on personnel. Their maintenance budget for rural uh, gravel roads was 8 million rands. And instead of putting out to tender to maintain the gravel roads, they decided that in actual fact they get more coverage if they buy their own plant, their graders, uh, their timber trucks, uh, uh, you know, water tankers. And they did that, uh, but of course, uh, they, they break some rules in getting that done uh, because they want to in-house or in-source the function of maintaining gravel roads rather than taking them out to tender. And the municipal manager was sort of, uh, you know, um, indicating the difficulties at times that are inherent um, in, in departing from uh, those kind of arrangements because there are also uh, competitive issues. I mean, Umkanya, uh, the district municipality, tried to insource some of those maintenance functions, and the Amatela or Bona in Kwazulu Natal were still saying that they will demand 30% of the budget, even if that budget is not going to be taken out to tender and so on, and it's about insourcing. So I do think that there are special uh, requirements for rural municipalities that depart from the requirements for uh, urbanized municipalities and metros um, with a significant footprint in terms of landmass uh, where they've got authority and jurisdiction to determine things such as rates and uh, revenue generation mechanisms because the rural municipalities, again, unlike the metros, um, still have another problem. The majority of their customers, in terms of the people who receive electricity, are direct ESCOM uh, customers, and therefore are unable to leverage at times even on electricity. Whereas the metros, the surcharge that the metros have placed on electricity, because they are effectively partly distributors, and um, helps them with generation of electricity. Of course, some uh, observers of uh, revenues for municipalities have indicated um, how unsustainable it is for municipalities, particularly metros, to rely on revenue generation through electricity. And I suppose as we are discussing different mechanisms for energy generation now going forward, where there might be far more localization and so on, <coughs> municipalities 
will have to be somewhat innovative in how they consider revenues for the future, um, if indeed the position of ESCO is weakened. But I mean, that's not a short-term problem, it's probably a medium-term to long-term problem. The one thing that has always been spoken about, and I think they call you to this, um, is this issue of the political administrative interface. Um, that is a problem for local government. And again, some officials within the municipalities put it as <coughs> um, the office of the chief whip is too close to the office of the municipal manager. Chief whip sometimes thinks that they are co-governing the city with the municipal manager. There's the blurring of the lines, there's the fighting of decision making that would not only should lie with the administration, but the politicians want to take over certain administrative functions. I mean, if you look at the stories of conflict between municipal managers and mayors and councils, particularly like Nelson Mandela Bay, and, and the court cases that have been fought out there, it's quite clear that there's something that we have not yet effectively done uh, to insulate the administration from the political uh, sphere. Of course, in the national government, you've got a problem where DGs are vulnerable to the whims of uh, ministers and politicians. And I, and I think as long as that is not sorted out, the political administrative interface and the institutional arrangement of our municipalities, we are still going to have massive administrative issues in the system and not be able to sort of uh, take things forward. And I think that's one of the core things. If we were to talk about reimagining local government, that we really have to reimagine in a very serious way. I mean, if you look at the city of Johannesburg, I'm sure um, you probably, as an official, are not so sure which way you need to go because politicians are always effectively looking for some allegiance from the administrative officers. Those administrative officers will try and stick to the line of being administrative officers and not be swayed by the politics. Do tend to be casualties at times, but the turnover of politicians in office in an environment where the political administrative interface has not been robustly defined enough to insulate the administration from the politicians, it still creates problems. I mean, you'll find an MMC coming in and then making life difficult for a CFO in one of the municipal entities or the other, and then they go, and that CFO is gone, another uh, MMC comes within a year or a year and a half, they do the same thing as well. And we know, for example, if you look at uh, the Joburg market, uh, there have been a number of allegations of various political parties uh, being uh, in, in interference with the functioning of the chocolate market. Of course, it's one of the biggest markets in the continent, if not in the southern hemisphere. So it's, um, it's, 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 it's that one thing for me, if you were to talk about uh, reimagining. I, I do think that we need to decouple the conversation between rural municipalities and um, significantly uh, urbanized municipalities. I mean, municipalities in Kwazulu Natal, for example, like big conflicts with the Ingonyama Trust. I mean, you think that it's just sponsored views, but the Ingonyama Trust Act is very clear that there are certain areas that fall within its jurisdiction that over time should actually be re-demarcated and redefined as townships, whatever that would mean. And of course, once they are redefined as townships as per the Act, they would then be under sort of the, the purview of the municipality because you know, their development levels of the private living high about infrastructure services and getting those into those communities would then mean that the municipality can uh, revenue generate in those areas. Unfortunately, uh, there's just massive reductions. You can go to an area called Adams in the in the massive double stories there. The municipality thinks that it should be revenue generating, it thinks that the area should be integrated to the municipality's um, jurisdiction but it remains under traditional leadership. And I do think that in South Africa, whilst we've tried to have this cooperative governance model, we do still need to interrogate the role of traditional leaders. Um, some traditional leaders have even been uh, resistant to implementing uh, laws such as SPLUMA, um, uh, and, and, and which should be helping us manage our land use better as a country everywhere you are in society, so that those who still <coughs> require grazing land are able to have grazing land, those who still require farming land are able to have farming land, and there's still residential land. But the sustainability of society generally across uh, the, the divide, and I do think that 
uh, once a provision has been made for some percentage of council seats to be given to traditional leaders, uh, particularly uh, in local government, and they can come into the council, they can listen to deliberations and be part of deliberations, that integration hasn't led to effective cooperative governance. And uh, there is a bit of resistance of ceding powers. Uh, traditional leaders are still looking for more powers, and as you know, there are big challenges, whether it's to the traditional courts uh, and act and, and so on. So I think for me, uh, in terms of where I am in my mindset, uh, that, that's where I am. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is a project that was commissioned by uh, uh, the late A.G. Kiwi Makwedu. Where he was trying to understand the relationship between good audits and service delivery. And so I think we sampled uh, two municipalities in the Western Cape, two in Free State, two in Northwest, which was sort of like uh, your best audit performing province, your middle performing audit province, and your worst performing uh, province in terms of municipal audits. And it's quite clear that even in municipalities that are doing well in terms of their audits, there's still a huge uh, disproportionate share of expenditure of resources and neglect of communities that you may deem to be in the periphery of those municipalities. There's still massive squalor, lack of infrastructure. If you go to places such as your Philippi uh, in Cape Town and you ask what are some of the key problems, water and sanitation are amongst the key problems. We have in highly densified areas. We haven't found ways to get services there in agile ways that are sustainable and that we can think of as you know, building sustainable communities. And whether or not we can build sustainable communities in conditions of some of the communities that are within our municipalities, uh, and, and, and particularly non-revenue generating in most instances um, uh, that they are, because sometimes municipalities will tell you, sometimes the budget follows where the money comes from. But of course, you've got the collapse of municipalities, um, you've got collapse of Joburg, where even the highest rate payers in the city are not getting the services that they require still drive through a pothole for two months and all of those things, uh, which tells you that something has gone significantly wrong in the administration of our cities. And yes, indeed, we do need to reimagine local government, uh, but I do think that we do need to clean up local government, build robust systems for it, because it's quite clear to me that local government, if we worry about uh, institutions that have been captured in the state, I do think that local government is one of the most captured institutions with multiple interests that are stifling any form of progress and um, institutional reimagination. And what that cleanup looks like um, is something that uh, I think can be left to a discussion. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you very much, Mboni. Good evening uh, to everyone. My name is Pilile, as introduced by Nicole. I must firstly begin by thanking the Helen Sussman Foundation for the wisdom to conceptualize and host an event of this nature. I think we can all agree on the importance of an event of this nature at this particular time in our constitutional democracy. But I must also then, on behalf of the South African Human Rights Commission, thank you for inviting us to participate with you at this very important event. I must also foreground my participation by just stating our support to the Helen Sussman Foundation. As it faces incessant violence and threats of violence in its support for the human rights of migrants, not just the, the Helen Sussman Foundation, but other human rights defenders. As the South African Human Rights Commission we have made our position very clear that we will stand in support of human rights defenders, but particularly we will stand in support of the human rights of everyone who lives in South Africa, including migrants. We are also very conscious and aware of the disparities and the differences in the nature and form of the xenophobic attacks it has a particular skin color, and it has a particular historical context. Those who are usually the victims of xenophobia 
are often of a particular body, and that body is black, and that body is historically marginalized. Questions are not asked similarly to migrants of a white and other race, and therefore, as the South African Human Rights Commission, we recognize this and we continue to condemn it. I then want to speak about accountability. In my contribution around questions of local governance and the dysfunctional state of local governance, a crisis that, uh, uh, as we call it and recognize it. As we observe the place that we are in in our constitutional democracy, we are tasked with a lot of reflection on Saturday, I had to drive someone in Durban to RK Khan Hospital. And they were sick and had to be taken to hospital uh, as a matter of emergency. And while waiting for them outside in the parking lot, I decided to just drive around. And about three minutes or four minutes outside of the hospital, I was met with a just a flood of sewage on the street. And informal settlements just lining the street. Children playing, people eating and selling food. Amongst all of this. And it makes you think about the Constitution itself and its ability to have a direct impact and protection of the rights of these people against a municipality that is failing and in crisis mode. So most people have rightfully asked whether the Constitution itself is the problem rather than the implementation of the rights in the Constitution. And this is where I want to start by just emphasizing that the Constitution itself creates quite a robust framework for not only democratic, but also accountable local government system. And it does so by providing that the local government system is responsible for the provision of services, basic services, in a sustainable manner. It then also obliges, particularly the national and the provincial government, to establish and introduce legislative and other means to support this local government sphere. And by doing so, it recognizes that the local government sphere on its own is incapable of addressing some of these deep and systemic problems, many of which are inherited from our very recent colonial and apartheid past. So it introduces a system of cooperative governance for all of us to be able to work together. And what then this national and provincial sphere of government does is introduce means of legislation by in particular and amongst others, the Municipal Systems Act, which then foregrounds this relationship between the local government sphere as well as the citizens by centering within this relationship, this notion of accountability which on its own is based on mutual trust and mutual loyalty. Because where it starts, uh, Nicole comes to me and says, uh, Commissioner, I am running for local government elections. I would want you to vote for me. And I say, okay, sure. If you do so, what is in it for me? And she says, well, I promise to deliver basic services to ensure that you have your right to clean water, your right to sanitation, your right to education, your right to housing, and so forth. And then by virtue of that conversation, we enter into a contract. I say, I will vote for you on the basis that you will deliver these services. And by virtue of voting, I sign my allegiance and participation in this contract between myself and the public representat representative. So this contract between public representatives 
and citizens is what guides the framework for accountability and the framework for how local government should be perceived. Now, often we see a shyness amongst local government leaders in particular to be held accountable by citizens. But similarly, we also see a shyness and reluctance by citizens themselves to participate and exercise their rights as well as their responsibilities as per legislation, particularly as I've referenced the Municipal <laughs> Systems Act, which, and I referenced Chapter 4 of the Municipal Systems Act, gives a very clear understanding of what the rights and what the responsibilities of these two partners or parties are within this relationship or this contract. On the one hand, local government has a responsibility to ensure that they involve citizens in the conduct of their duties, to ensure that they consult citizens, to ensure that they enable an environment of public participation, and to cooperate with communities in the conduct of their duties. This is a responsibility and it's also a duty of the local government sector. Similarly, the citizens themselves have a right, but they also have a duty and a responsibility to one, understand the terms of reference of these contracts that they have entered into. And this by also being conscious of their rights as per legislation and to participate in the processes of local government, including the IDP processes, but it's not limited to the IDP processes. To participate in what committees, to attend open meetings of the municipal council, to submit complaints about issues relating to service delivery and the delivery of their basic rights. And in doing so, then you have this relationship or this dialogue between this sphere and citizens. But of course, this is also then supported by the provincial and national government. As the South African Human Rights Commission, where do we come in? We are established by Chapter 9 of the institution, and we are established amongst other independent, independent institutions, such as the Public Protector, the Auditor General, the CRL Rights Commission, and the CGE. All of these institutions are independent and are obliged to act without fear and in a non-partisan manner. We have different responsibilities and mandates as Chapter 9 institutions. For example, the CGE is responsible for looking and one, recognizing the historical gender disparities and then ensuring that as we move along our democratic dispensation, we address these issues and we advocate for an equality or an equity when it comes to issues of gender. Similarly, the CRL Rights Commission recognizes issues around um, culture and language and linguistic rights. Ours is a three-pronged mandate, which is to protect, to promote, and to monitor the observance of human rights. And this mandate then puts us directly in conversation with local government because all of these rights in the Bill of Rights are realized at the local government sphere. We live in our local communities, we drink our water in our local government, uh, in our local communities, and so forth. We go to schools in our local communities, and so forth, and so forth. Now, in the execution of our duties and our mandate, we have, over the years, similarly to other public institutions, come to the realization that the task of holding government accountable for the protection and the promotion of human rights is a mammoth task, but it, it's a task that is becoming increasingly difficult because of the crisis that we are facing across all 
local government, locals. Now, as Umgoni also insinuated, I will leave the numbers to Lance, who will understand. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm giving quite a big responsibility to Lance, but uh, I will leave the numbers to, to him. But I, I, I want to just highlight that the failures at local government are multi-pronged and multi-leveled. You've got inefficiency in leadership, particularly strategic management and, and, and uh, senior management positions. You've got political interference, particularly in the appointment of senior managers. You've got a shortage of skills as a result. And all of this come together to add to this crisis that we have. If you don't have skills, cadet deployment on its own is not a bad phenomenon. But cadet deployment outside of a consideration for the skills of the one being deployed against the position itself becomes a recipe for disaster, which is what we are seeing in a lot of local government institutions. We as a South African Human Rights Commission, I see that Nicole is indicating that my time is slowly running out. But I do just want to, before I sit down, highlight some of the shocking statistics that are coming out that show the problems that we are facing at the local government level. The Department of Cooperative Governance each year releases a state of local government report. And as of the last year's report, these are some of the numbers. 66 out of the 257 municipalities are absolutely dysfunctional. Now, the Constitution makes allowance and creates measures for the support of local government institutions that are in crisis through Section 139. It provides that the provincial government can intervene. Now, we've just looked at the numbers, and currently, as of April 2023, only 33 municipalities are under Section 139. The question then is, what happens to the other 33? They are carrying on even after the findings of the state of local government report. They are carrying on with that state of dysfunction without any intervention. Now, what then the consequence becomes is a heavy reliance on consultants. And I just want to quickly read the numbers, Nicole, if you will bear with me. And I will read the numbers as per the 2020-2021 report of the Auditor General, which states that over the five years from the 2020-2021 financial year, 70% 70 70 of municipalities were using consultants every year amounting to about 5.3 billion used on consultants. Now, in addition to that, and despite the use of consultants, 119 billion had been spent on unauthorized expenditure, uh, fruitless <coughs> and wasteful expenditure was 11 billion, Significant financial losses were estimated at about 3.9 billion, and this is just in the 2020-2021 financial year. Now, what is to be done about this? Uh, the, the focus of this round table is how do we reimagine a local government beyond this? During our or as an outcome or an output of our local government conference, which was less investigative, but more of an academic exercise that sought to really pull minds together from different areas and different backgrounds to think about this very same question. We came up with a number of 
recommendations that we think are very important to consider. The first being the professionalization of the local government sphere. And I hope that Lance will also speak to this because it sits also with the mandate of SALGA. You can't have as councillors people without a metric. You've got to be able to balance your compassion for historical disadvantages and the importance of skills for this very important sphere of government. So some kind of system for professionalizing the local government sphere is incredibly important. Community participation, and this is where civil society comes in, is absolutely crucial. Not just in IDP processes, conscientizing communities, programs such as Know Your Rights, but also participating in council meetings, the provincial legislatures, and even national legislatures in accordance with their mandate to support local government. The role of academia and researchers is absolutely important, especially when it comes to monitoring the extent to which the dysfunction is happening at local government, because we do need that data. Without the data, we can intervene. <coughs> Issues around climate change, as seen most recently in KZN, are absolutely important. And I'm going to pause there. In conclusion, and as, as I close up, Lukona mentioned the relationship between what we understand as local government and traditional leadership. This is an area that also requires reimagining, if I may put it that, that way. Now, we can't think about this, Lukona, without thinking, for example, of the traditional courts bill. The traditional courts bill locks people. So what Lukona is making an example of, that when you drive out of his neighborhood and five kilometers out, that is the end of the boundary of the municipality. Those people outside of that boundary, if they have a complaint about their the basic services, they cannot opt out of the traditional court's bill or the traditional court according to the traditional court's bill. They have to complain to the very same people that they are complaining about. And those uh, people which are the traditional leaders become the prosecutors as well as the judge of that matter. Now we have seen examples of the consequences of the traditional courts bill in the case, the famous case of King Ndalinjiebo, uh, where the system can be abused. Now, what do communities do when they have no option to opt out of a system that deprives them of their human rights? This is a question, and I hope that we can deliberate further. Thank you very much, Nicole. Well, thank you very much, uh, and, uh, and, and may I start by extending greetings to our program director, uh, fellow panelists, and and all of the attendees uh, here today. And and as I was sitting there listening to my learned colleagues, uh, we all know each other, by the way. Uh, we will still talk about that part. But as as I was sitting there, I was whispering to Tracy that we love acronyms. We just absolutely love them. We love acronyms and we love numbers. So, so we were brought together here today by the HSF at Gibbs. <laughs> and we've got Paris, Salga, SHRC, uh, RC uh, to make contributions to us. And we're talking about IDPs, SDPs, <laughs> DDM, and the list goes on. So we can have a conversation in acronyms. And then, second part, they say I must speak about numbers. <coughs> so it even gets more confusing. Uh, there is 2000, 2006, 2011, 2021, 2016. That's when all of the elections took place. When we started in 2000, we had 284 municipalities. We're now with 257. We have 
uh, gotten rid of 27, so all of the numbers. Sitting with four districts, eight metros, 205 uh, locals. 81 coalitions, 50 of them are stable, 31 are stable. We love to talk about 31. Do you hear the numbers? 280 billion owed to local government, 80 billion owed by local government. Do you hear the fact that 280 owed to local government by you and I, the businesses we work for and the government we work for? 80 billion owed by municipalities to everyone else. The maths don't tally up, but we are good at talking about the numbers and doing nothing about it, and talking about acronyms and doing nothing about it. So my 12 minutes that is left after my, my rattle is I'm going to speak about the six areas that we've been asked to speak on without having uh, HSF uh, that did very well. They didn't tell us what to prepare. We are talking about reimagining local government, and there are six areas you want us to focus on. And so I want to reimagine this local government that has gone through all of the numbers of 2000, 2006, 2011, 2016, 2021. Five elections, number of municipalities having been reduced over the years. And how do we reimagine that? And all of us that I've mentioned are operating in this space. How do we reimagine this local government? And when I think about uh, the unfortunate part, I have been a practitioner in local government for 24 years. Another number, 24. And I recall, and I'm reminded by uh, the documentation that we are exposed to, uh, and those of us that were there, or recall the excitement that was linked to creating this last sphere of government after everyone has channeled their energies into negotiating national and provincial government and what comes with it we then started talking about this other one local government and when you look at the white paper uh, another number 1998 white paper it paints a exciting story of what opportunities local government has to, and municipalities by extension have, to turn around the lives of ordinary people. We called it a local government that is developmental in nature. It is much concerned about the realities that faces people and how we uplift them into better realities. That's what the intention was at the time. We now have the benefit of uh, 25 years of experience since 1998. And we are asked the question, how do we reimagine re things? Uh, my response is, I don't want to reimagine it. I like the picture that was painted in 1998. How do we breathe life into that picture? So one of the areas we're asked on, what has been the challenges of local government? I limit them to four areas. I'll spend one minute on each of the three, and the last one I will spend a few more minutes on because it's the most important one. Four challenges. One, our service delivery infrastructure has collapsed. But I must make this point so that you do not say I'm talking about every single of the 257 municipalities. Generally, the challenges that find expression are these four. There are pockets of excellence in local government. There are municipalities that are executing their responsibilities very well. They are just not here with us in this city for the reasons that you know. But the first problem is dilapidated, collapsed service delivery infrastructure. So, so the inability to deliver services because both your movable and immovable infrastructure are unable to assist you to do so. Uh, Tracy, when we spoke outside, she said, they are struggling with water in our area. And the uh, core to that is service delivery infrastructure. That, that's the main problem. And you'll find the same on other service-related uh, functions. Second problem is that um, we do not have 
the systems, the processes, the mechanisms to deliver services. You will find pockets of excellence, but generally across municipalities, there's a serious lack of uh, systems and processes and rated mechanisms to provide services across their areas of responsibility. The third area is the one that uh, I've been launched to speak on, but I will talk about it a bit later. It relates to the unsustainable financing of municipal services. Municipalities are technically bankrupt, a majority of them. And uh, uh, for varying reasons, uh, scary part is municipalities are charging for services that are below the cost of delivering the service. Providing services to us and unable to collect. Thirdly, ill discipline when it comes to financial spending and financial management. And fourthly, I partly agree but do not wholly agree with it is that there is not sufficient allocation of funding to local government. Where I disagree is I think there's enough money that, is, that can go around. But we must address the first three issues on, on, on financial sustainability. Collect what is due to you. Cost your service at a charge that where you recover your costs, at least recover your cost. Uh, thirdly, introduce financial discipline. Um, and then we can talk about, well, fourthly, spending what is allocated to you and not let it return to the fiscus. Then we can start talking about additional funding. But I think, personal view, not a Salga view, there is enough money in the system, but we are not using it appropriately. So those are the first key, three key uh, challenges. But the biggest one is the one that talks about people. Uh, we do not have the correct political leadership. So we have leadership weaknesses politically. We have leadership weaknesses administratively. So first three problems. One, you can have the best service delivery infrastructure. You can introduce the best systems processes to deliver the services. Thirdly, you can have the most, you could be the most financially sound municipality. But if you bring poor political leadership and administrative leadership into the mix, I can't give you more than three months. I think in three months you will show us how financially unsustainable you can be, how infrastructure will collapse around you just simply because of leadership. Uh, and what is this leadership that we uh, are talking about? Uh, I will give you an example. Many of, of you may have heard me before. I have said in many fora, in Salga, we have a, in fact, the question was asked to, uh, early last week in Parliament, and I, and I responded as follows. I said, we have a, a mandate to, to build the capacity of municipal officials and councillors. And we spend huge resources every five years to do so. But what happens every five years? You have an election, and you have a turnover of three people returning. So out of 10, three people come back. You have developed the capacity of people. You lose them because they have not returned as counselors. That's the reality. Seven out of 10 counselors do not return. There is a municipality in the free state of the entire council of 62. Three have returned, 59 are new. Salga, where are you? Come and uh, build the capacity of these people that have never worked in a municipality, have to not understand IDP, SD, budgets, clueless. Do not know how the organization is structured internally, but in the first month they are taking decisions about you and I in that municipality. So what did we do as Salka? We said to political parties leading up to the 2021 elections, simple request, we said, can you just bring us the right people? bring us the right people that would be able to take the decision 
that is linked to 560 billion, another number. As we speak, municipalities are processing budgets that are likely to end up, when adopted, 560 billion rands will be spent by municipalities over the next 12 months, with effect from the 1st of July. Can we get the, in Joburg, what is it, 80 billion? The 277 people in Johannesburg who are councillors in their own right, elected so, are taking decisions about 80 billion rands. We, we know what is a billion. We know what is a billion. You and I will never spend that in our lifetimes, with your, with your family included. But times that by 80 will be spent by 277 councillors in one year. Can we get the right people to take the decisions about the 80 billion in Johannesburg? And we are wondering why we're having this chaos that we are seeing in Johannesburg. Uh, calculated chaos, some call it. Uh, others call it chaotic chaos. But the reality is we are not having the right people. And if we get the right people in the system that are appropriately skilled, qualified, experienced to take decisions that are linked to 80 billion, I think we would have a different form and shape of local government. Uh, so addressing that weakness is, uh, is, is critical. I have three minutes left. And in that three minutes, I'm going to cover three aspects of these six areas. Uh, the first one is the easy one, corruption, mismanagement, and lack of service delivery. There's an acknowledgement that, that, that exists in local government. It is rife in local government, but there's a relationship between that and one of the four key problems we have raised, leadership. So uh, we have corruption because there's a lack of accountability, firstly, and consequence management. So no one goes to jail. We know money is disappearing. No one goes to jail. If someone goes to jail, we don't get excited anymore because we're asking about the others. What about the others? Um, so consequence management and, and, and holding people accountable is linked to proper leadership, both administratively and, uh, and uh, politically. The second area I will reflect on is what is stated as the decoupling of politics and administration. Lukona attempted to address the issue, did quite well. Uh, we're always thinking about politicians getting involved in the administration. But we don't talk about the other part, the administration getting involved in politics. And using political caps to protect themselves as administration. Uh, and so uh, you would have heard that Salga has advanced a view. It is now legislation that no staff man in a member in a, in a municipality must hold a political position. It's legislated. We are now told it's going to be challenged. So, so we want to say the chaos must continue. We must have an administrator. Let me give you an example, real example. Real example. This is what a study we have done tells us. Municipal manager says to us, you know, I have a, I have a difficulty that uh, in the morning when I arrive at work, uh, I see the tractor driver, you know, the ones that Lukona referred to, that goes and scrapes the roads, the gravel roads. I see him standing at his tractor, uh, and uh, as I get off my car, he says, Chief, let me just remind you that there is that matter on your desk. Uh, please deal with it today. A, a tractor driver in a municipality telling a municipal manager, can you sign what is in your office? Who is the tractor driver? is in the executive of the, of the party that leads in that municipality. So it's given instruction not as a tractor driver, given instruction as a member of the political party. That is a difficulty we have. But municipal managers themselves are also not uh, uh, angels. Uh, here's the second example, real example. In a municipality, council is meeting, municipal manager presents a report, and uh, the council is not agreeing with this report. Before the council can take a decision, he writes a note to the speaker. He says, Chief, can you just convene a caucus? And what does the speaker do? Convince a caucus. 
municipal manager leaves his seat as the municipal manager walks into the caucus as the chairperson of the region. And he says, uh, you will go back into that meeting and take the following decision. What is at the core of the problem that you are raising? Is that you have an administrator, whether it's a municipal manager or a tractor driver, using their political position to advance interests that are contrary to that of the municipality. And that is the problem that we have. So we are waiting for this constitutional challenge. We, we will be at the forefront to, uh, to defend uh, that legislative um, uh, provision. The last one in my 30 seconds, coalition governments, and it's painted here as uncertainty caused by coalition governments. They have been with us since 2000, that nice figure. 2006, 2016, 2021, 2011. There have always been collisions. There are 81 current as we speak, and it's a ticking bomb because when you have by-elections, it changes powers. Uh, or when people get excited by promises made to them, collisions also change. But we have 81 municipalities that are collision-led. 50 of them are stable. Stable coalitions. Why are we not interested about why they are stable? No one is talking about that part. What is working in that coalition that is not working in the 31 out of 257 municipalities? So we are very interested in the bad apples. But can't we use the experiences, positive ones, in the coalitions that are stable and try and implement them in the unstable uh, areas, but it will require political change, and uh, that can only come from the electorate. Thank you very much. So um, let me jump right in. I think everybody else has thanked everyone else. Um, what I wanted to um, talk about in, in, in the space that's um, been hopefully not covered by the other panelists, is to have a look at some of the structural factors that are contributing to the poor performance of local government. So we can agree that it would be ideal if, if everybody who worked in a municipality had the correct skills. We could agree that it would be ideal if, if there was no corruption. Um, but my position would be that that is not sufficient for us to have a local government that is delivering what is envisaged in the Constitution. Yes, we might all have clean audits, and we might have skilled staff. That does not necessarily mean that local government is going to be fulfilling the spirit of what it is um, meant to be fulfilling in, in, in terms of the Constitution. So let's have a look at, um, at, at two of those issues. Um, and the first one I want to start with is the local government fiscal framework. Just that phrase normally makes people want to fall into a coma. Um, but really, it is about the amount of money that local government needs in order to deliver its mandate. But most importantly, um, and what we hardly ever talk about, is where that money comes from. So the way in which local government was envisaged in the 1998 white paper was this understanding that 90% of its operating expenditure requirements, and last year um, local government's operating expenditure bu budget was about 420 billion rand, that 90% of that expenditure could come from the levering of property rates, electricity sales, and the provision of water and sanitation. And electricity was going to be the most important one out of that. And, it, and we need to remember that many critical areas are funded out of that, including infrastructure maintenance. Local government doesn't get any contribution from the national fiscus through the equitable share for infrastructure maintenance. It has to fund it out of its, um, out of its own money. Now, there, apart from, I mean, we, we can talk about corruption and, and poor financial governance, and obviously every cent that leaves the local government because of that is a bad thing. But very often, the amount of corruption and financial mismanagement in local government is grossly overstated. If we have a look at the amount of money that's been appropriated, for example, in the state-owned enterprises and in the other spheres of government, it's way more than is lost to genuine corruption in local government. Every year when the Auditor General re releases the MFMA reports, I know at everyone at my local radio station, everyone goes bananas and says 80% of expenditure in local government is corrupt. 
um, looking at the, the um, irregular expenditure. But even the Auditor General themselves will say that the vast majority of that irregular expenditure is because of tiny issues of non-compliance. You've got a municipality in the middle of nowhere, they want to buy three wheelbarrows, they need three quotes, but there's only one hardware store within 100 kilometers of the town, so they didn't get the three quotes, so that's classified as irregular expenditure. And the vast majority of what is irregular expenditure are tiny things. Even the Auditor General will say that goods and services of appropriate quality are um, have been purchased. So it's really good that from next year they're going to start reporting on that differently. So what is the main problem in the local government fiscal framework? Well, there are a couple of issues. The first thing is that when we redesigned local government in 1998, it was the most significant redesign of any sphere of local government. We were really creating a brand new system. So we had to make some assumptions about how much money was available. Nobody in 1998 would have imagined that we would have the situation we have with the electricity price, for example, which has greatly reduced the margins for people to, to earn, uh, municipalities to earn a surplus on electricity. And they have to earn a surplus on electricity. That's the way in which the, the model works. Nobody would have imagined that we would have the household poverty levels that we have at the moment. Um, and what has also happened in the intervening period is that the amount of money that municipalities have to spend on compliance and reporting has, has gone through the roof. In some small rural municipalities that get clean audits, they spend more than half of their budget actually on financial compliance and reporting. So they spend most of their money telling other parts of government what they did with the money. But by far, I think the, the, the biggest problem with the local government fiscal framework is that it relies on desperately poor households paying for services with money that they do not have. You need to understand that South Africa has a 55% household poverty rate. 25% of households live below the food poverty line, which means their total monthly income is not sufficient to buy a basic basket of food for the household. Where is the money to pay for municipal services supposed to come from in those circumstances? Even households that live above the food poverty line but below the upper bound poverty line um, are still compromising on food to pay for services like electricity. So research that's been done by the Black Sash and other organizations has shown quite clearly that the main household item that is sacrificed to pay for services like electricity is food expenditure. The main reason why child care recipient grants borrow money is to pay for electricity. So the entire system depends fundamentally on impoverishing poor households. What is developmental about that? What is the point of forcing people to pay for their municipal accounts so that they compromise the nutrition of their children? And it, it makes me really, really cross when people talk about the, a culture of non-payment. Yes, of course, we understand Santa and City must pay for it and other parts of government must pay for it. But this idea that the only reason why people don't pay for their municipal services is because they can't be bothered reflects an astonishing lack of interest in the lived reality of the, of the average South African. The, the Minister of Finance in, in the budget speech says that people must correct their behavior and, and, and pay their municipal accounts. Pre presumably they must also correct the amount of food they feed their, their children. Um, so there, there is this assumption that people must simply pay for their accounts, but what we're doing is we're making people poorer. The free basic services policy has been a dismal failure. Um, it doesn't provide enough, especially of, of electricity, and it only benefits about 25% of the households it's supposed to benefit. There are multiple problems there with, um, with implementation. And electricity is, is, is once again a, a critical issue. Um, I do agree with Lance that um, I, well, I, no, I, I sort of agree with you, but not really. Um, in terms of the cost of supply, I think that we need to understand, municipalities need to understand the cost of supplying a service. But if, for example, in the city of Joburg, if that cost of supplying the service includes 40% technical losses because the infrastructure is falling apart, why should the residents have to, have to pay for that? I mean, that's, that's outrageous. So we can't say that a cost of people must simply pay for the cost of supply. We need to know what it costs to supply a service so that we can optimize that, so we can make it as, as efficient as possible. But can't simply expect that people must simply pay all, all the costs that, that are in the services. But in order for us to have a truly developmental local government, we need to understand that more households need to be supported to access 
um, services that are directly related to their quality of life. The ability for households to afford electricity is directly related to their food security status, not just through the diversion of income from other sources, but also because the main demand for electricity in low-income households is for cooking. So I, I was working with a student from University of Utrecht, and she was talking to women about the choices they make about what to feed their children. And one woman said to her, she said, I know that sugar beans are much new nutritious than quick cooking maize, but I cannot afford the electricity that I need to cook that food item for longer. And so I take the, the cheapest and easiest item. And once again, the black sash has also shown that a lot of people's choices about what to feed their children are not based on poor nutritional knowledge. They're based on the fact that they cannot afford the electricity to cook the, the more nutritious food. So we need to have a real rethink of that part of the system. The second issue is around the obligations of provincial and national government. And here I want to talk about section 139 because Section 139 has more or less been something of a disaster and people like to say it's a useless part of the Constitution. It's actually an incredibly valuable part of the Constitution because what Section 139 says is it says quite clearly that the constitutional rights of people who live in a municipality is more important than anything else. People like to talk about independent and autonomous local government. There's no such thing. Nowhere in the Constitution does it talk about any independent or autonomous sphere of government. The intergovernmental relations framework doesn't make local government some independent, autonomous fiefdom. It talks about separate and interrelated spheres of government. So what Section 139 says is it says, if a municipality is not doing what it is supposed to be doing in terms of delivering those constitutional rights to people who live there, then there is a legal obligation on provincial, and if fa it fails, on national government to go into that municipality and to fix things. Section 139 was not intended to be implemented three years after a municipality had been broken. It's not a remedy for, break for a broken municipality. It's meant to be the vaccination against a broken municipality. You can't use the vaccination to cure things. Let's not get into that. Um, so. I mean, so one of the municipalities we worked in, Taba Zimbi, before there was a provincial intervention in Taba Zimbi, the municipality was so, dis I mean, basically nothing is delivered there. Every single movable asset in the municipality, its computers, its vehicles, its everything, had been repossessed twice by its creditors before there was an intervention. The only reason anyone in the municipality's got a desk or a chair is because the local platinum mine lent them the equipment. They couldn't even give it to them because the creditors would have come and, and, and taken that as well. And when you you know, listen to the National Council of Provinces and, and um, the provincial cogtas talking about why they don't intervene. They trot out the same old story, which is that local government is an autonomous sphere of government, and which they're not, but supposedly that gives them the right to trample over the people who live in the municipality, and we just stand by and ignore it because somehow we've created this independent sphere of government that doesn't exist. And that is why we actually don't have a remedy in the Constitution for fixing a completely broken municipality. We don't have a remedy. Section 139 is not the remedy. We have no remedy. And we have a number of municipalities on, that are now in that very broken state, and we have no tools for how to address it. So one of the first things would be to say that we need to start using section 139 the way it was intended, which is to prevent a municipality from ever getting to that completely broken state. There's another act that also allows that, and that's section 63 of the Water Act. Section 63 of the Water Act gives the Minister of Water the right to ask a province to institute a section 139 intervention in a municipality that's not meeting its water delivery obligations, and if the province won't do it, for the department to do it themselves. We all know the state of, of water and, and sanitation delivery in South Africa. I've rather terrifyingly talked to a lot of people in the Department of Water who seem blithely unaware that that section of the Water Act even exists. Um, so, so we have tools, we need to use them properly. In terms of reimagining um, local government, um, I would say we need to go back to the drawing board. The bucket's broken, right? We need to go back to the drawing board. And the place to start is with this understanding that local government in its current structure is merely a means to an end. It's not the end. It's, it's not, there's no rule, there's nothing in the Constitution that says we have to have local government that looks like this. It is a means for delivering people's constitutional rights. It is a, a, a means 
for delivering quality basic services in a pro-poor and developmental way. And I strongly believe form must follow function. I'm always solution agnostic. The best solution is the one that fixes the problem. We need to, we need to put what it is that local government is supposed to deliver front and center and then go and work out something that is going to, to deliver that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lukona, Palile, Lance, and Tracy, for what were really incredibly enriching contributions. Um, and I think uh, enormously um, insightful uh, and enhancing of our own understanding of the issues uh, that are confronting local, government, local governance and um, problems regarding delivery. What I'm going to do now is just ask um, for those in the room to, by a show of hands, to indicate um, questions. And we'll take about three at a time, and we'll also sort of refer to any questions we have online. So can I just have some indication of, of interest? When? OK, let's start there. OK. Use Hi, thank you so much for your contributions. It was very interesting. Um, so as a layman, not connected to local government at all, there were just two concepts I expected to hear something about. And I just wondered if anybody had any feedback about decentralization or privatization in this reimagining of local government. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, everyone. Very enriching. Um, my question is, if you had a magic wand and there was one legislative change that you could accomplish tomorrow within the sphere of local government interventions, what would the, the most burning legislative change be um, that you could envision to, again, magic wand and fix things? Got one, one more question here in the front. Okay. Uh, my question is going to all the panelists. Um, you mentioned that um, the electorate or the citizens have to be consulted. Um, how practically is that correct? How practical is it whereby they go and consult the electorate? especially on the issue of sin, um, anything that has to do with service delivery. The reason why I'm asking this question is we have seen a lot of delivery protest. This is a reflection that there's a breakdown between the, the communities and the senior leadership. Then on the issue of the collisions, it's clear that uh, they are not working. I'll just give you an example. Uh, Lynn said there are 51 that are working, if I'm correct, and the others, they are not working. We are in a situation whereby what the electorate has voted for is not what is happening. For example, uh, if we have to look on the issue of Johannesburg, currently there is no mayor. It might be a big embarrassment that we have to wait again for a week to decide. I'm, I'm not sure if the citizens are going to be involved in giving their voice on the leadership, or uh, it's going to be political decisions. And um, Pelile also mentioned that uh, in most senior positions, uh, they don't check on the skills. They focus more on political. And at the end of the day, th the citizens or the communities are affected and also from the human rights side, 
is there anything that you can do when you see that there is a situation whereby there is poor service delivery? It's because of lack of leadership. Can anything be done? Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone want to, to, to respond? I think those were all sort of uh, questions sort of directed. Yeah, sure. So, do I need a mic? There you go. Um, you can hear me. So, um, uh, you're not disconnected from local government because you live in a municipality. Um, so, I mean, I think in, in terms of, it is on. Oh, it is? But it's yep. on. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Um, sorry about that. So, I mean, I think in terms of issues around centralization and privatization, I mean, my personal view would be once again that I'm agnostic at whatever works best. Um, you know, there are many people who are completely opposed to any kind of privatization at all, and there are people who are completely opposed to, you know, the state being involved in this. And I don't think either position is helpful because the reality is very different. There are people in municipalities like Mabuba municipality where they're getting an excellent and, and cheap electricity service from outsourcing to rural maintenance. The people who live in Amadapeni, they will tell you the state's not that great at delivering anything. Um, but also there are obviously areas where the state is doing an excellent job of delivering things and private companies are doing a, a, a bad job of it. So it's about what is gonna work best and, and everything works best in a well-regulated Would you change overnight through legislation and uh, fix a big part of local government? I'm going to contextualize it with the, the last part that says uh, collisions have created uh, chaos. Uh, you're currently sitting with no mayor in Johannesburg. And Tracy and I spoke. I said, What's worse? There's no mayoral committee either. And there will not be a mayoral committee on the 2nd of May because the mayor will be consult unless the list will be given and said here yeah, appoint this mayoral committee but, but you are likely to see uh, perhaps even a third a week or two uncertainty and when new people are appointed there you can have to speed with developments prior to executing the responsibilities we had a problem in Nelson Mandela Bay uh, municipal council was required to take a decision would avoid day zero, couldn't take the decision after a while. Recently, Tswane could not adopt an adjustment budget, budget to, aim, to enable it to deliver services. So here is my proposal, and I hope you have connections to the right people when you get the answer, is to introduce, my suggestion would be, remove the uncertainty by creating a more stable administration and allowing the administration to get on with it. In many mature democracies where coalitions are normal, there is no collapse in Italy. Services are being delivered, there is no problem. Whilst there is uncertainty at the political level, services continue. So, so the proposal is to provide an empowering provision for the administration to continue to deliver services, to take decisions on day zero, take decisions on budget, budget adjustments, so that services are delivered to the people. You will see how quickly the political challenges are resolved when you give that type of power to an administrator. And here I'm talking about the head of the, of the, of the administration, which is a municipal manager. I know you have negativity around it, but properly guided, Let's give them appropriate powers to continue with business. Thanks. Thanks, thanks Max. Um, I'll start on the first question by 
I was just highlighting this notion that's cropping up of an alternative state, which has been brought about as a result of the failure of a lot of the local government institutions, but not just local government institutions, but public institutions in general, where the citizens are beginning to rely on civil society as well as the private sector for services that should otherwise be delivered by the public sector. And I think we should watch this very, very closely because it's going to have implications in the long run. I do not necessarily have a position on this currently except to say that public services, the government has a responsibility to deliver public services as per legislation. And then the question is what happens when those responsibilities are then shifted as we are seeing the, the implications being this establishment of an alternative state. And you see this with the development of water, for example, and, and other institutions, the private sector coming in to deliver food. And in, in KZN, we currently have a food crisis in the education system. And a lot of private institutions as well as NGOs are coming in to the So those are some of the questions that I think are also important to consider as we think about the, these notions of decentralization and privatization. Now with regards to the magic wand, I like wands, I hope we've got the power of um, I would say that the first one would be, I have a serious concern about the powers and the responsibilities of council. And if I had a magic wand, say that no councillor should be elected without a particular qualification. The public service had an institution called Palama, and that's going to accuse me of acronyms. Palama, I, I don't know what it stands for, but it was the Public Administration Leadership and Management Academy. That's what Uh, it has since changed to become the National School of Government. And amongst the roles and functions of the National School of Government is to ensure, especially amongst the senior management service of the public service, that in order for someone to be employed in a particular position, they have to have received certain qualifications from the National School of and as, a, as an intermediate at local government level, I would introduce a system that is similar. And in order not to disadvantage victims of historical uh, disadvantages, I would say perhaps persons can be elected to being councillors, but within a period of their five-year term, they should have secured a particular qualification, or else that person should be removed. Now, I will also want to speak to the question around how practical is it to consult citizens. I still think that the United Democratic Front model was one of the best models of public participation that the South African uh, society in general has ever had. Straight committees were the very best which brought communities together and galvanized communities against the apartheid system. And that is something that can still work for us in ensuring that our local government enables communities. But using that model, <coughs> we can also take advantage of technologies. We live in the so-called fourth or fifth industrial revolution, where almost everyone has access to social media. So it becomes even easier for government institutions to consult uh, the citizens. And when they are not consulted, it, it really is a matter that needs to be questioned, especially when the resources are available to them as they are. And thank you. 
sure they are quite a number of uh, things, but the biggest problem is South Africa is that the politics is broken. And once the politics is broken, it's difficult to build any institutions that are centered around politics. I'm not so sure who's going to solve that, uh, because as my sister again is saying, advocate Mahmoud Moirani, his conclusion of the political violence report in Bosnia and Natal, confronted by this low threshold of entry. And this is why there's a lot of fighting because you don't need to have any qualification to become a councillor, so there is a red race, and that's why there's political violence and so on. But he still erred on the side of uh, democracy and people's choice. But I mean, it's the electorate that must perhaps demand a higher standard of the political parties. Like Salga said, give us the right people. Is, us, is society doing that and making it a deal breaker in terms of if you don't give us a person of this stature, then we will not vote for your political party, no matter how much we are connected to that political party. I don't think that citizens in South Africa tend to be let scot free in terms of taking some responsibility of responding in ways that uh, reply and rebuild a different political culture. I mean, there are a number of things that you can think about. When I went to St. Albans, a small town just outside London in the UK, um, the mayorship there is actually quite ceremonial. Uh, it's a rotating mayorship. Every year there's a new mayor in the council. You don't have to uh, really invest much powers. I mean, some people have been asking, why is Durban all those many parties. I mean, Durban has about 18 parties that account for 23 seats. Like a very fragmented coalition arrangement. But it's still, you know, besides the clownish mayor who's a rapper or from a piano from time to time, um, uh, generally the coalition is holding quite stable. Even when Mahmoud the deputy mayor sort of pulled out or was fired from it and so on. Um, and that's because it's not an executive mayor system. And some people have been saying, we need to look where are the most unstable municipalities. Is it where we have the executive mayorship is, is, the, is, is the real you know, trophy that people want to get. So in Etebini, you've got a, a mayoral committee system where there are 10 seats and the determination of who occupies those seats is a, is, a, is a product of the representation of parties in the council and we proportionally share those, which the ANC has decided to donate one of its seats in that committee to the AP see so that they could secure the coalition anyway. But, but it, it seems to provide a greater sense of stability. It's an assumption, I think it's an assumption that needs to be tested and looked into in terms of uh, are these executive mayorships uh, inherently uh, like that. So that would be the second thing. If we were to talk about I mean, decentralization and the, and, the, and the magic wand, um, I'd, I'd, I'd say, look, if there's one thing I'll change in the Municipal Structures Act day one, councillors must not chair what committees. That's, that's the one thing. Because it stifles the entire logic of what committees and access and participation and so on. The big one would be do away with your provinces and, and rethink the spheres of your government. That would be a big one for me. I, I'm aware that Tracy has to leave um, just before eight, but I think, I think we've actually got food and drinks outside. So for those who can stay, we'd really like you to, to stay and engage our panelists in, in discussion in a sort of more convivial atmosphere. So I think we're going to sort of release everyone and hope that you stay and, and chat afterwards. Thank you so much for your participation this evening. Thank you so much to our panelists um, for your con contributions um, and to all of you for attending and for those of you online who participated. Thanks very much and we'll hope, we hope we'll see you shortly at another roundtable event. Thanks. <laughs>